Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the channel. Today we will talk about the chronic superhepatitis media, atequental type, which is also considered as unsafe here. Uh, in previous discussions, we covered chronic superhepatitis media, tubo tympanic type, which is comparatively considered safe here. The links for that are given in the description, so you can check it out there. So let's start today's discussion. So you please subscribe the channel so you are not going to miss any of the important topics. Lining epithelium of the middle ear cleft, you know, it is not the same in all parts, it is different. Entero inferiorly it is ciliated columnar epithelium and this is the part which is mostly affected in tubotympanic type of the disease. Posteriorly it is cuboidal and in mastoid air cell system it is a pavement epithelium that is flat non-ciliated epithelium and this is the posterior part of the middle ear cleft which is usually involved in this uh, chronic superhepatitis media eticoenteral type we are going to discuss. Definition of chronic superhepatitis media, all of you know very well that this is a chronic disease. So, naturally, it is a, a long standing infection of the middle ear cleft and it is characterized by either continuous or there can be intermittent discharge through a persistent tympanic membrane perforation. This is the comparison of tubotympanic and aticoenteral type that why. The tubotympanic is safe and why aticoenteral is unsafe. Aticoenteral is unsafe or dangerous because it involves first thing is posterior part of the middle ear cleft and it is associated with an attic or marginal perforation. It is a bone eroding process due to the presence of the cholesteatoma or the granulations or osteitis and the risk of complications is higher. Etiology and bacteriology is the same as we discussed in tubotympanic type of the disease and it is characterized by persistent or intermittent discharge and this discharge is scanty, foul smelling, occasionally it can be blood stained with hearing loss. Perforation in case of aticoenteral type, it is either marginal that is posterior part of the pars tensa is usually involved or there can be a perforation in pars flaccida which is also called as attic perforation and then cholesterotoma is the hallmark of this aticoenteral type of the disease. So this is how the attic granulations may appear on otoscopic examination. Pathophysiology of the disease, disease is that as I just mentioned that cholesterotoma is the hallmark of this disease. In addition to that there can be osteitis and granulation tissues. Granulation tissues here it may fill the attic, antrum, posterior tympanum, mastite and these granulations they will bleed on touch and if a polyp is there it will be a flashy red polyp in the external auditory canal. Then there can be cholesterol granuloma as the name indicates. This is a mass of granulation tissue with foreign body giant cells surrounding by the cholesterol crystals, then we call it as cholesterol granuloma. Then ossicular necrosis due to the destruction and this destruction may be limited to only to the long process of incus or it may also involve stapes suprastructure, handle of malleus or even the entire ossicular chain and definitely there will be greater hearing loss. Then your patient may be what we call as cholesterol hearer. What does it mean? that the cholesterotoma is filling whole of the middle ear cavity and it is acting as a source of conduction of the sound from the external ear to the inner ear. So, after removal of this cholesterotoma surgically as a treatment of this disease, the hearing may worsen. So, this is what we call as that that particular patient is actually a cholesterotoma hearer. What is cholesterotoma? It is a three-dimensional epithelial and connective tissue mass in the form of a sac with a lining of stratified squamous epithelium. 
stratified squamous epithelium and it is filled with desquamated debris frequently containing the cholesterol. It is also called as keratoma or epidermosis. Keratinizing squamous epithelium in the form of a sac, it may involve the whole middle ear cleft. There is tendency to recur and it is progressive and independent growth at the expense of underlying bone. So it goes on expanding. So this is how the flakes of this cholesteatoma, whitish flakes may be visible. So this is presence of keratinizing squamous epithelium in the middle ear or the mastoid or in other words some people call it as that this is the skin in the wrong place. It has got two parts that is the matrix with a central white mass that is a keratin. So this is the normal ear and here you can see this is the cholesteatoma. And this is the matrix and here is the keratin whitish mass. Outside is the bone and gradually it goes on expanding at the expense of this underlying bone and it can go beyond the confines of the bony confines of the middle ear cleft. Clustiotoma is classified into congenital and acquired Acquired can be primarily acquired and second, secondary acquired cholesteatoma. From where this squamous epithelium comes in the middle ear cleft? There are many theories of origin of this cholesteatoma. One is congenital cell rests, then is Wittmark's theory, Rudy's theory, Haberman's theory, Sade's theory. So, let us discuss these theories a bit in detail. Bitmax theory says that due to the negative pressure in the middle ear cleft, which actually is due to the justitial tube dysfunction, there is invagination of the tympanic membrane in the attic region or posterior part of the pars tensa in the form of retraction pocket. So, to start with, there is a shallow small retraction pocket and the outer layer of the squamous epithelium from the tympanic membrane which travels from the center towards the periphery and along the external aortic canal walls it is being shed off outside through the entritus of the external auditory canal. But when there is a small retraction pocket these squamous epithelial cells surface squamous epithelial cells they go on being collected in that retraction pocket so that hampering the migration of that shed of superficial squamous epithelial layer and gradually they go on increasing and increasing and this shallow retraction pocket it is it is being converted into a large size pocket and even its neck becomes narrow so that ultimately the tympanic membrane gives way and there will be a perforation in the attic region or in the posterior marginal perforation of the pars tensa. Another theory is, and by the way, this Wittmax theory is the most plausible theory. In Rudy's theory, they say that there is basal cell hyperplasia, which proliferates due to infection and it lay down the keratinizing squamous epithelium. That basal membrane breaks due to the repeated inflammation are due to the repeated infection and squamous epithelium it invades into the sub epithelial tissues in the pars flaccida like epithelial cones forming the micro cholesteatoma. This enlarges and ultimately perforates secondarily through the tympanic membrane. So this is Rudy's theory. Haberman theory says that there is epithelial invasion from the meatus are from the outer drum surface. There is a pre-existing perforation and part of the annulus tympanicus becomes destroyed. And Sayers theory says that this is metaplasia, that the uh, normal, this uh, columnar or cuboidal epithelium, it becomes uh, squamous epithelium like respiratory mucosa elsewhere and due to repeated infection, it is converted into squamous epithelium. 
so this is the retraction pocket to start with this is very shallow small one and gradually it is increasing and this outer squamous epithelium which is being shut off it is being collected in this one and ultimately it gives way this is basal cell hyperplasia or the rudy's theory that there is microcholesteatoma and this is how it gives way ultimately with the postosterior marginal perforation congenital cholesteatoma embryonic epidermal cell rests in the middle ear cleft or the temporal bone they are seen in the middle ear petrous apex cerebello pontine angle in the middle ear there will be a white mass behind an intact tympanic membrane so there will be no perforation in case of congenital cholesteatoma and it will cause conductive type of hearing loss and it is discovered usually on routine examination or meningotomy is being done for some other reasons it may spontaneously rupture and then it can start discharging so congenital cholesteatoma not only in the middle ear but it is present in other parts that is petrous apex and cerebello pontine angle so this is the petrous apex it can be in this side or it can be there at the cerebello pontine angle it can be present there or behind an intact tympanic membrane there will be a whitish mass which we call as congenital cholesteatoma so primary acquired cholesteatoma there will be no previous history of otitis media or pre existing perforation tympanic membrane will be intact invagination of the pars flaccida and persistent negative pressure in the attic region leads to retraction pocket with accumulation of the keratin debris which we discussed in witmax theory and ultimately infection and it expands and it perforates into the middle ear basal cell hyperplasia we just discussed proliferation of the basal layers of the pars flaccida induced by subclinical childhood infection and the third possibility is that squamous metaplasia normal pavement epithelium of the attic undergoes metaplasia and converted into keratinizing squamous epithelium due to repeated infection so this happens in primary acquired cholesteatoma in secondary acquired cholesteatoma already there is a pre existing perforation in the pars tensa and it is associated usually with posterior marginal perforation and migration of the squamous epithelium that is keratinizing squamous epithelium of the external auditory canal and the outer surface of the tympanic membrane it migrates through the perforation into the middle ear or there can be metaplasia due to repeated infection of the middle ear through the pre existing perforation so this is what it is called as secondary acquired cholesteatoma this is atheric region and this is in the postosterior margin perforation so how cholesteatoma expands and cause the destruction of the bone it enter the middle ear cleft and it invades the surrounding structures so atic cholesteatoma it can extend backwards into the adytus and through the adytus it can go into the mastoid antrum and mastoid air cells downwards it will can go into the mesotympanum and medially it may surround the incus and the head of the medius it destroys the bones ear ossicles and erosion on the bony labyrinth as well there is a release of different enzymes which help in the destruction of the bone like collagenase acid phosphatase proteolytic enzymes like osteoclasts mononuclear inflammatory cells so destruction mechanism will include one is through enzymes as we just mentioned that certain enzymes are being released like collagenase phosphatase proteolytic enzymes then pressure theory that uh, as the cholesteatoma is being uh, expanding so it causes the pressure on the surrounding structures then they say certain hormones may be released and it causes the osteitis that is the inflammation of the underlying bone 
So directly it can spread through the congenital dehiscence, which are na naturally present there, or through surgical dehiscence. If previously some ear surgery is being done and there is some dehiscence, or through normal sutures, it can spread beyond the confines of the middle ear cleft. So with that, we conclude the session for today. Uh, we will continue with the clinical features and treatment in uh, next sessions. So if you like the content, please subscribe the channel and thank you very much.